Okay, we're live. Hi, this is Claudia Phylos with the Center for Linux Studies. We're here today with a CHS open house discussion with a very distinguished guest, Ryan Fowler. Thank you so much for joining us, Ryan. Hi. So, um, Ryan, can you just tell us a little bit about yourself, uh, where you're teaching, uh, and about your areas of research? Sure, absolutely. Uh, <clears throat> I teach and teach uh, for Franklin and Marshall College in Lancaster, Pennsylvania. Uh, I've, I've taught uh, almost exclusively in liberal arts colleges, Grinnell College and Knox College as well. I have a, my PhD from Rutgers University that way, uh, not very far away in New Jersey, um, New Brunswick. Uh, I did a, a dissertation on uh, the use of Plato, the use and um, engagement uh, with Plato in during the second sophistic, which is what sometimes we call the first few uh, centuries of the Common Era, the early Christian era, um, the sort of renaissance of Greek literature after um, Plato and the classical era. Uh, I also uh, so I teach uh, whatever they ask me to teach here, and which is um, Greek and Latin, Latin philosophy and Lucretius, uh, and I uh, I teach biblical Greek across the street at the Lancaster uh, Theological Seminary. So. Um, and I was a fellow last year, last semester at the center, working on uh, Basil of Caesarea, his letters in particular, and the role of uh, of uh, non-technical, non-canonical rhetorical devices in his letters. So, rumor and silence in awesome. his letters. Yeah, it was fun. It was really Thank you so much. So, um, could you just say a few words about what attracted you to studying Plato in particular? Because today we're going to talk a bit about. Um, how and why uh, mm. people were reading Plato in the early common era, correct? Mm. Yeah, yeah. Um, what interested me, well I started out my uh, education in philosophy, I didn't know any Greek or Latin for uh, a bachelor's degree and a master's degree and I uh, was attracted to actually um, uh, 19th and 20th century continentals interest in the ancient philosophers, uh, Heidegger and Friedrich Nietzsche in particular. They kept coming back to them. It was, it was a thing. It was clearly a thing. So I uh, went back and tried and learned Greek and Latin and realized that I'm, it's just quicksand. It's just you're stuck. It's because there's <laughs> tragedy and there's philosophy and there's, there's letters, there's the, the, uh, the various epistles and um, there's comedy. It's just extraordinary. This world that opens up um, in antiquity. Um, and I, I was interested in Plato, frankly, and as I um, started to study, I got later and later and later. Um, I went from the 5th century and the 4th century and I started to move toward the early centuries of the Common Era because my interest um, was very, very quickly became, um, how did Plato affect early Christianity? And, mm -hmm. and he did. He shaped it not him, but his works and his ideas. Um, and then I, I quickly realized that everyone in the first and second centuries AD or CE or what have you, um, knew their Plato, he was part of the curriculum, and he, they had to engage with him some way. Christians, non-Christians, um, I don't think we call them pagans anymore, um, very much. Uh, so it, it became how, how did all of the this massive incredible work influence and how did he how was he able to um, influence such uh, disparate groups of people and they all claimed him as their own whether they attribute their um, use of his his ideas or not they all claimed him or claimed his ideas as their own so um, that's what interested me, that impact he had in the, in, on Christianity and resurgence of, of classical lit in the early centuries. Beautiful. Okay. So, um, so what, would you like to just begin by um, talking about, well, we do have a handout that some people in, um, in so the people, quote unquote, in the room here in Hollywood's Garris, uh, we've shared that with them. Uh, we, have a, we have one handout that's already posted on the Hour 25 right. um, website. The beast. The beast. 
It's beautiful, okay? Now, in addition, um, if you're watching live, uh, we do have an updated handout that we can share. Um, I guess we're going to share after the fact. I don't think we can manage to post it during this Hangout, okay? But uh, if you're watching this and it's recorded, the, hangout, uh, the handout that will be associated with the blog post on Hour 25 will be the updated handout, okay? So thank you so much, and welcome to all of you joining. Uh, we will stop at a certain point to take questions um, from our audience. Okay, so, we'll, so we'll look forward to that. So, um, at any point, uh, at any point, that's please. We should discuss. Yes, absolutely. Okay. Um, so, so okay. So let's just begin. Is that okay? How, how would you like to begin, Ryan? Would Would you like to begin with the handout, or would you like to begin just by talking about the dialogues, the ideas? Um, well, I'd like to. I'd like to read through some of the texts of the dialogue because I think of the handout because. Um, well, they're a lot more interesting than I am, and they have to do with really things like what a dialogue is. So my my interest is my focus um, in this particular work um, and this particular. So I'm I just uh, tr um, have been working on translations of really Platonic handbooks. I'm interested in um, how people were learning and introducing Plato to new people in the second century A.D. Right, so um, the, there were a variety of ways, <clears throat> so new, new neoi, new um, uh, students were being exposed to Plato, and these handbooks and summaries and really sort of cliffs notes were, came to a, a, there was a resurgence, a really a, um, uh, um, a, a, um, a market for them a large market for them in the first and second and third centuries CE. So I was interested in that. And what I'd like to talk to you about right now, very quickly, uh, is one example of those uh, handbooks. Um, and it was written in the second century CE. It's called, uh, the translation is Introduction to Plato's Doctrine or the Dialogues, sometimes uh, the Introduction to the Dialogues of Plato, or the Prologue of Albinus or Latinized albinus, and um, <clears throat> the reason he's interesting to me is he. I think his ideas are representative of the kind of Platonism, the kind of Platonic ideas, and the way people are, um, the way Platonists who think that they're expounding Plato's ideas <clears throat> in the second century really felt. Some of those are um, Alcinous. Um, Apuleius, the one who wrote who wrote the Golden Ass, actually was considered himself some kind of Platonist. Um, Maximus of Tyre <clears throat> was a sort of sophistic Platonist. Um, Albinus um, or Albinus is very interesting because Galen. Some of you, many of you, probably have heard of Galen, a medical writer. We have more Galen, I think, than we have of any other ancient writer. Um, attended the lectures of an Albinus, and, and there's every reason to believe that the chronology works, that this is, this is who he saw um, speaking. So whether this, this is just a little work, it's four and a half pages long, um, so I translated it with commentary, and that'll be coming out um, later this year, but um, we don't know if it's student notes or summary of a lecture of another Platonist, Gaius, or, but it's, we, it's the only work that we're certain is his. And <clears throat> the reason I want to go through it is there are some really interesting little details in it that I think reflect the concerns about reading Plato in the early common era. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah. what do you mean by the concern? Well, um, people wanted to know, um, uh, and this is exactly what I wanted to talk about, the order, it, it, came, it comes about that the that the understanding is the order in which you read the dialogues will affect what you learn, how you learn it, and in a sense, the kind of person you become, which is rather extraordinary, I think. Um, so not only given your natural talents or your ability as a student, that will affect the order that Albinus thinks that you ought to read these dialogues, but also um, you have to be careful in some ways about how, the order in which you read them. And what, I, what was interesting about this is I just typed into Google last night 
um, in what order should I read the dialogues? And I found in Reddit and a number of other websites, people really concerned about this. Students saying, okay, I've just bought the complete works of Plato. Where should I start? So this is not just the second century. This is now people saying, look, there is this is a this is this is clearly important. There's clearly a lot of ideas here. Um, where where should I begin? So it's so really, you know, two thousand years later, um, we're um, we're uh, 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 or uh, I should say. Um, uh, a, a number of you know centuries, centuries, centuries later. It's it matters um, how to approach this stuff. Right, so, and because yeah. it sounds like really, I mean, the very intellectual and spiritual um, development of the individual yes. is at stake here with with that how you order these. That's these that that is exactly right. Um, if we get to the, if we get to the end, we'll see that the point, the goal of these Platonists. Is what they call homoiosis, homoiosis theoi, the assimilation with God or the gods, sometimes plural, sometimes singular, and 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 it's defined by Albinus as um, getting a, and he uses a lot of adverbs of clarification here, um, having a clear and distinct vision of the divine, te, uh, ta tea. So this is this is everything. This is this is. This is um, nothing short of of the persons, and in some cases, being um, as it were saved. But certainly, <clears throat> without a doubt, um, it'll affect the kind of person, the kind, the way you behave, the kind of person you could possibly become. Amazing. So, at, so at, at stake okay. is everything. So we have a question already. Yes, great. Can we take some question? Great. So, Laura, please. Well. Um, I was just wondering whether um, people in the first and second centuries um, had the same obsession that modern scholars do with, um, I guess, what you would call chronicity, um, of ordering the dialogues into an early, middle, and late period, which yeah. like most of the ink that has been spilled uh, uh, in modern times has been. So was this a factor for Albinus? It's 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 very very interesting. Uh, I can I can jump ahead. Um, I just want to read. Yes. Okay. So you know, if if this works into your argument as we go along, that's it. It it, it, it it does. The the answer is yes. Um, the the very simple answer is Albinus says, and he admits this. He says, look, there are people who have chosen to order the dialogues based on the dramatic characters. And circumstances of their lives, so the people internal to the dialogues. Some uh, have done it um, so that it um, best fits the stage, which is a very interesting. And I, we don't have any example of that. Some of them are thematic. Um, we have the say the trial, all of the dialogues about the trial, prison, and death of Socrates, and that's one way to do it, right? The Euthyphro, the Apology. The Crito and the and the Fido, the Fido, and because uh, so the Apology, uh, so the Euthyphro because it reports the charge, the Apology since it's necessary for that he defend himself, the Crito because of the conversation in the prison, and the Fido, um, since in this dialogue Socrates reaches the end of his life, and this is how they want to arrange all of them. Um, there are indications that <clears throat> Plato himself might have thought about um, grouping them, um, in that he talks in the Timaeus about um, a dialogue that had just happened the day before. Um, um, so there are, um, in, in Albinus, and this is, where, this is where I want to get to, he says there are stages of learning that one needs to achieve, and different dialogues are, um, can um, um, help us reach different stages of learning where it'll get us to where we want to go. So that's exact. That was a. Tr it's not. It wasn't a worry about the chronology. Um, it was a worry about whether it should be thematic, chronological in the dramatic dates, or the best way to read them um, as instructional tools. It's a long, long-winded way. 
of explaining that. But, but so it's very interesting that um, that you say that. And one of the longer in the appendix that I of the longer handout I gave you talks about what we call um, tetralogies, the the tetralogies of Thrasyllus. And what he's done there, what Diogenes tells us he's done, is he groups them together um, in a way. Um, um, well, and we can talk about this very quickly. I think this is a, an amazing moment. In Diogenes, um, Laertius, who's written and writing in the 3rd century CE, he says, um, just as long ago in tragedy, the chorus was the, was the only actor and afterwards, in order to give the chorus breathing space, Thespis dev devised a single actor, Aeschylus a second, Sophocles a third, and thus tragedy was completed. So too with philosophy. In early times, it discoursed on one subject only, meta namely, meta namely physics, or natural, uh, uh, natural law. Then uh, Socrates added the second subject, ethics. Then Plato the third, dialectics, and so brought philosophy to perfection. Thrasyllus says that he published his dialogues, Plato published his dialogues, in tetralogies, or groups of four, like those of the tragic poets. Thus they contended with four plays at the Dionysia, the Linnea, and the Pan Athenaia, the festivals of the tragedy. Um, of the four plays, the last was a satiric drama, and the four together were called a tetralogy. So there were explanations on, various explanations on why Plato, how Plato grouped these together. What's interesting about this, I think, is it affected survival, as many of you um, have thought a lot about, I'm sure, um, what survives in, from antiquity and what doesn't. The oldest manuscript of Plato, which is um, from about 895 CE, contains the first six tetralogies. So they follow the Thrasyllian groups of four, and because it, th that part of the book survived, the first six survive intact for that reason. So this is going to affect survival of Plato in, some, in the way that, that Plato sur survives. Um, That's beautiful. Yeah. I think we have some other questions? Or Absolutely. Yes, Janet. Uh, welcome, Professor Fowler. Uh, hi. Um, you said you have a natural talent, and on that natural talent, um, it will be determined where you start your dialogue. So you have natural talent, and uh, dialogues will be the nurture. So you have nature nurture together, and uh, you are going to be a person. But your starting point for every person is different. Yes, that's wonderful. Oh my gosh, you guys are fantastic. One of the major points of this dialogue, <coughs> if you go through the handout, uh, one of the major points of this of this of this um, this small handbook, if you go through the either one of the that large handouts, you'll see um, that what's very important to Albinus is that. Um, is the what's called ethopoeia of Plato, and in Plato around this time is is becoming to be understood as a genius at character creation. He can he he um, he his individual and um, his his various characters within his dialogues um, are going to be one of the things he's known for, and <clears throat> this is very important in the characterization of the dialogues for Albinus. And he has this amazing image. And it's rather, it's, it's absolutely, it's unique um, among any of the handbooks that I've seen. And this is actually M on your newest handout. <clears throat> he says, his teaching, Plato's teaching, or doctrine, it's logos, uh, being perfect is like the perfect form of a circle. Just as the start of a circle is not singular and determined, neither is his doctrine. Then there's a break between chapters. Therefore, we will not delve or read his teachings in a haphazard manner. When someone needs to draw a circle, for example, he does not draw it starting from any point whatsoever. So starting from whatever attitude each of us may have with regard to his doctrine, he will delve into the dialogues. So <clears throat> this is often... <clears throat> this circle image is considered odd and sometimes confused that there may be two points here. 
it's not singular and determined um, like his doctrine, but we need to start somewhere. So I think I don't think it's it's really problematic to see um, how this works. Um, at first glance, a circle has no first point, right? It's when we draw a circle, though, we have to start somewhere. The difference for albinus can be understood um, as the difference between being simply passive and looking at a circle and active, which is drawing a circle. So <clears throat> if we look at the list of what characteristics matter to him, there, um, <clears throat> if we just look at a list of Plato's dialogues, the complete works, there doesn't seem to be a start. But albinus is going to tell us wh which ones to start with and why and it's based on where we are in our lives. So it has to do with my experience with philosophy in general, my age. In fact, we can talk about the different characteristics in a second. But what determines our reading order, it, since it's not haphazard, is our talent for closely and slowly reading, I would say. Our age, <clears throat> are we of the right age to philosophize, too young? Um, is a problem. The purpose of our wanting to study philosophy, do we just want to win arguments or do we want to construct or understand or search after the truth? The level of our education and <clears throat> this is great, um, the amount of leisure we have, um, which as many of you know matters. <clears throat> we need time in order to read these dialogues. So. What I love about Albinus is that <clears throat> he takes into consideration our current state and circumstances as readers, and that is what will determine the ideal reading order of the dialogues for us. What it also points out is that we need a guide. We need a teacher. We need someone to help us determine those things about ourselves and then help us understand which dialogues to start with. But I think that's an amazing point. Yes. All right, Ryan, so I can already see, um, I'm going to have to ask to book you again, because there's so much to talk about here. <laughs> can we yes. pause? Okay. I, I always ask people if they'll come back on air. You know, it's, a, it's a nice trick I use if people are, <laughs> I want to say yes, and then I have it in public. Um, yeah. So, hold on. So, Sarah has an interesting question, I think, oh, and we have other questions, too, that are coming yeah. up. Sarah. Oh, you, you, when you were talking about, you know, it's a circle, and so where do you start? It just reminded me of the beginning of Odyssey. Um, yes. You know, starting from any point of departure, but then there is a right point of departure. So uh, is it, uh, I, I'm, I'm extrapolating backwards because I'm not familiar with Plato, but yes. um, is he kind of drawing on that kind of tradition, do you think? Or is, is there something more deeply philosophical in the Odyssey, maybe? What do you think? Well, the, the so there, um, the, Homer is used by Platonists um, quite a bit, and if some of these images are absolutely beautiful. There's, for those of you who have read the Phaedrus, or who will read the Phaedrus soon, I hope you do, it's an extraordinary work. It's one of the most um, invoked images of, I, I, okay, not all of antiquity, but certainly of Plato, are the, the chariot of the soul, the, the wild horse, and the sort of reasonable horse and the and the charioteers the, is the is the soul perhaps under a lot of images and 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 it's the, it's through this this flying chariot that we have a vision of the forms or of the gods. Um, there's a great um, article by Michael Trapp which I'll send to um, send send to Claudia on the charioteer in antiquity. It's it's highly invoked. But what some of them do are they merge the image of Paris riding wild down the hill past his brother in order to get to the battle first with this charioteer of Plato and it's in its it's written in a way where it's seamlessly merged it's absolutely extraordinary so for a lot of the second sophistics for a lot of these people in the early common era who are interested in <clears throat> engaging with Plato and Homer for them, Plato and Homer were more or less contemporary, could have been contemporaries. They fought with each other, they contended with each other, and they built off of one another. They um, understood education in response to one another. And so 
Um, and the classical era, back to Homer, becomes monolithic in a way. And so, yes, the Odyssey, I would go back to the fact that the Odyssey is, is allegorically uh, interpreted by the Stoics all the way through. Um, Basil of Caesarea talks about him when he goes wandering. He is Odysseus. He becomes Odysseus. He wants to invoke that image. So yes, I think that there's something deeper going on there. The the circle, I think, has to do with the idea that um, there are ideal ways of reading the dialogues, but in the end, they're always going to get you to the same place. They're always going to get you to... And I wouldn't say, and I, if I wanted, if I if I was able to extrapolate on <clears throat> Albinus, I wouldn't say that it's a circle, but maybe a coil, which is this. It's this these circles that take you take you someplace. And tat thea, the divine, is the place. And sometimes it'll take you a long time if you don't follow, if you work against your own natural talents, if you work against yourself. As if anything, sometimes we're not ready for books. Right, we've all maybe we've all experienced this. We've read it. And we think, if we, in our best, in our on our on our best days, we can say, you know what, that's a book for later. That's not a book for now. And I think the the teacher, the Platonic teacher, is the one who will say, okay, sure, you can start with the Republic. Uh, this this is going to be slow going, but or for another student, it's exactly what he or she needs. So I I imagine the circle is. This idea of, of well, and also going back to this, just the notion of the circle. If you go back to Parmenides or or any pre-Socratic, the circle is perfect. It has no corners. It is every edge is equidistant from the center. It is there's something flawless to it. God is a circle. Um, this is also in uh, um, what work is this? Oh, it's in um, Apuleius. He says God is um, uncircumscribed. And the idea is, I think, that emerges from this is a circle where its middle is everywhere. Um, and, you know, I'm not sure that I, I have a, a big enough brain to understand what that means exactly, but it's, it's, I, I get where we're trying to get. I, I get what, we're, what the idea is I think we're trying to, to approach. But um, there's a whole bunch of questions, uh, Claudia, so we, I hope that helps a little bit, but I, I think those are some of the ideas that are going on. That's beautiful. So, okay, I mean, and I know that we do have questions, but I, you know, I know we're going to have time to continue these conversations even after this hangout. Is there something, you know, would you like to proceed further in the argument? Let's um, go through questions. That's all right. More. That's Rock on. Okay. All right. Uh, let's see. Uh, who has a question? And also, you know, in a few minutes we can, um, why don't people start thinking about posting some questions in the Q&A if you're, if you're watching? So if you go to the, um, to oh, the yeah. Plus event page, you will be able to actually post questions for us directly through that page, okay? And we'd love to have your question. Oh, there are some questions, and I'm there missing lots. them. Yes. Oh, in the Q and A. Okay, do you have the Q and A open, Ryan? I do. I have the I have the group chat open, and there's an there's a question about mathematics and geometry. Um, that is an amazing point, and absolutely the case. Um, so can you read the question? And also, I just yeah. want to alert you, um, Ryan. So if you take your cursor all the way over to the left hand side of the of the frame. Yeah. Oh, that's the, Q, that's the Q&A. It's a Q&A. So we have two things yeah. going, okay? So yeah. I don't want to go there yet. I don't want to go there yet. I don't want to go okay. there. Okay. So soon, 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 okay? I'll go there. I'll go there next. Um, that that is um, you there's there there are two in my opinion uh, for what it's worth, there are two things that you have to that one should keep in mind when one is reading Plato. The first is the um, development of medicine and medical techniques at this time, the Hippocratic corpus and also Euclid and mathematics, mm -hmm. which is exactly the question. Is the subject of mathematics geometry starting to bloom at this time of Plato? Hopefully I'm correct. Yes. Wow. Okay. And this is also an influence. Straight line is eventually... Um, and, and, and. <laughs> and, 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 yes, and eventually and arc a circle. There's no question. So Plato is, in, in, in simp maybe in the simplest terms, Plato is trying to do with ethics and behavior what Euclid did has been yeah. able to do or has established to do with mathematics. And that is to start with um, to start with um, principles, right? Mm -hmm. The basic 
irrefutable principles and build from there, and the principles become something like the forms. So we're trying to have a justified true belief um, about ethics in a way that I think mathematics is trying to understand um, point, line, and circle, right? Point, line, um, two-dimensional object, three-dimensional object geometry. So yes, mathematics, and, it, and on the other side, um, the diagno uh, Plato's philosophy is diagnosis of the soul in the way that the Hippocratic corpus wants to diagnose disease in the body. And um, they use the same, many of the same words and same terminology. Um, the the uh, method is the same, which is um, definition, clarification. Um, so find out all of the possible symptoms and then find likelihoods and possibilities mm -hmm. and move from one to the next. It's exactly what the, I would contend, exactly what the dialectical process is in Plato philosophically. Find out all the possibilities. Find out what is the most logical and reasonable um, avenue. And you, you begin to specify. And if we all were to define our terms and eliminate ambiguities and misunderstandings, what a different world this would be, right? So that's exactly, I think, what Plato's dialectic is meant to do. Define and divide. Divide and define. Um, and that's exactly what's interesting about this. And when I come back, we'll talk about Obinus's handbook. But it's exactly what Obinus does. He Plato's Plato, his discussion of Plato. He starts out and he says, well, first we have to figure out what a dialogue is. And that's you a know, question that someone in our community already posted. You know, they, they're wondering what's the difference between a, play, a dialogue and a conversation. What, what is a dialogue? Yes, yes, yes. Well, can, I, can we talk about that for a second? Because that's actually some of the very first beginnings so, so the very first A on the newest handout, the very first uh, moment in uh, one of the very first moments in Albinus's handbook is this is um, this is for the person about to delve into or read the dialogues of Plato. It's appropriate first to understand understand this what a dialogue really is. Now, what's interesting is I don't think in the second century he needed to ask that. And my the reason I think that I think this is under B which is a, a B in your handout, well then thought, this is from Plato in the Sophist, 263e, well then thought, uh, dianoia, and speech, logos, are the same. Lo thought and speech are the same. Only the former, namely thought, which is silent inner conversation, dialogos, is um, an inner conversation of the soul with itself, has been given the special name of thought, dianoia. Is that not true? So that's from Plato, this idea of thought um, being a silent inner conversation of the soul with itself. What an extraordinary uh, definition. Lucian, in, which is who, who is contemporaneous with Albinus, um, has this to say in his work Literary Prometheus, which is, I think, um, C. Um, for one thing, there was no great original connection or friendship between dialogue and comedy. The former, dialogue, was a stay at home, spending his time in solitude, or at most, taking a stroll with a few intimates. That's amazing. Whereas comedy put herself in the hands of Dionysus, haunted the theater, frolicked in company, laughed and mocked and tripped it to the flute, where she saw good. Nay, she would mount her enipests as likely as not, and pelt the friends of dialogue, philosophy, with nicknames, doctrinaires, airy metaphysicians, and the like. And that's Aristophanes' comedy about Socrates, most likely. But dialogue continues his deep speculations upon nature and virtue till, as the musicians, musicians say, the interval between them was two full octaves, from highest to lowest note. Um, and at the same time, and I wanted to bring a Christian in, because I don't think they're represented enough in these texts. Justin Martyr, in his um, dialogue with Trifo, I think this might be D, I delight, said I, in such walks where my attention is not distracted, for discussion, dialogos, with myself is uninterrupted, and such places are most fit for philology. So 
discussion with myself, dialogos with myself. Are you then a philo philologian, says he, but no lover of deeds, which is built on philosophy, philosopher, philo philergos, or of truth, or do you not aim at being practical man so much as a sophist? And I think <clears throat> this is another really nice image. This is just a little bit before, a couple of centuries before Albinus, but Dionysus of Halicarnassus says, for the former spent ten years on the composition of his panegyric, this is Isocrates, according to the lowest record estimate of the time, while Plato did not cease when eighty years old to comb and curl his dialogues and reshape them in every way. I love that image of combing and curling and perfecting them. Um, and so Plato, as, I, as, as you can see in the text of Diogenes Laertius, written in the third century, um, in, at 348, um, says, in my opinion, Plato, who brought this form of writing, dialogue, to perfection, ought to be adjudged the prize for its invention, as well as it for its embellishment. Um, the the way yeah the way to talk the way to talk about dialogue I think in Plato is you would have to invoke the Alencus the, so the Socratic Alencus what is at that at least at least at least initially and the Alencus um, and Greg talks a little bit about this Professor Nash talks a little bit about this um, the Alencus the rules of the Alencus go like this I ask you a question and you answer it and I say something like what is courage Claudia and you say, courage is standing up for what you think is right. For standing example. at the front of battle, not giving way. Sure, not giving way. Absolutely, that's beautiful. There it is. <laughs> very, it's very Homeric. Right. On your shield or with it, Claudia. But um, uh, the, the rules are that in early Socratic, what we call Socratic dialogues of Plato, the earlier dialogues of Plato, is that I can ask you questions based only on your answer, right? So you say, standing in front of battle and not giving way, and I say, okay, well, what happens if you're not in battle? Can you be courageous? Okay. Right, and you say, well, I, well okay, let's, <laughs> yeah, right, and you, you amend your answer or what have you. And then, eventually, very often in these very early dialogues, we end, you, I, I'm able through questions to make you see that you hadn't thought necessarily all the way through your definition of courage, and you end up saying something that's the opposite of what you said in the beginning of the... Now, that wouldn't happen with Claudio, but it happened a lot with, with, with Socrates' interlocutors. No, that's sure to happen. So can I ask a question? So it sounds like, on the one hand, right, we have this whole sense of leading to perfection, okay? Yes. We have the sense that we have a circle, and that we need to, um, that we could pick up the point, uh, we could begin drawing the circle at a certain point that is appropriate for us. Yes. But it depends on our natural abilities too. Yes, yes. And we need a guide, okay? Yes, so, yes. Uh, but what's, so I guess it's because, uh, what, what I'm wondering about is this idea that, I mean, part of the Platonic dialogues that you're pointing out is that we don't really know ideas that we think we know, and we don't even know ourselves like we think we know ourselves. Yeah. So that's why we need the guide, is that it? Yeah, oh, you're, you're, you're the the best interlocutor ever. Um, so so let's talk for a second about. Okay, so I, I just want to I just want to. Yes, yeah, sorry, I interrupted you. Well, not not the slides. That was really important. I want to get right back to it. The 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 Alenkis doesn't isn't always the case with these dialogues. In the early so we uh, um, Euthyphro um, the. Um, Hold on. Can, yes. can we have another pause for a second? So placeholder, yes. can, can you yes. just outline for people who are new to Plato or relatively new, maybe they've only done what they've read yes. in, um, yes. in Heroes X, can you just outline a little bit about the, the overall works of Plato? Yes, yeah, absolutely. There and is we'll often, to, mm -hmm. yes, and then we have to go back there because it's really important. Um, there's, there's, there's often, so Someone mentioned, okay, there's a lot of ink being spilled about the order in which um, the dialogues were written. And we put, uh, and this is really goes back to Gregory, Gregory Vlastos and his early work um, with Plato. Um, there is often a, um, a division that's made in the dialogues of Plato. 
and it's done on it's done stylistically. It's done in the sort of the way that the dialogue goes. We have the early dialogues, the middle dialogues, and the late dialogues. And now that's not a perfect division in any way, shape, or form. But by and large, you'll hear about this. And by and large, what you can say is, um, in the early dialogues, dialogues is the central character and is perhaps expressing his own views or his own methodology of discussion, which is to ask people, uh, which is to, to contend with people about what they think they know, and by the end of the dialogue, very often showing through just simple questions, of course that's not true, nothing is just a simple question, um, that they don't know what they think they know, right? Uh, what did Mark Twain say? It's not what we don't know, it's that we're so sure about so many things that aren't the case. <laughs> but anyway, uh, that was a paraphrase. Um, so, so, so that was helpful. Thank you we, so much. So we can see we can see that Socrates that why Socrates was killed <laughs> by some of these dialogues. <laughs> we go to all of our leaders, all of those in power, and we say, say political a political leader, and we say, well, what's justice, right? And they clearly I show in public in the agora among other among my students or among my followers or whomever that this person obviously does not know what justice is, but he or she is in a position of distributing justice. That's not going to look good. That happens enough, things aren't going to go well. The middle dialogues are often considered to be, and that's, those are things like the Apology, the Crito, um, the Lysis, the Euthyphro, um, Carmides, these, these, these dialogues that are shorter, and they, they end in aporia, no way out. That's the, Greek, that's the Greek way of saying, uh, I'm speechless, I've got nothing. The middle dialogues are dialogues in which Plato is often thought to be expressing his views, as it were, in the guise of Socrates. Um, Symposium, Republic, the Protagoras, these are works that are no longer, no longer end necessarily in aporia, but are starting to discuss things like the forms and the idea of justice and that sort of thing. There's still dialogues, there's still questions, there's still a question and answer. There's a kind of remnant of the elenchus, of this back and forth asking questions about that are based on your answers. The later dialogues, they're still in dialogue form, but works like the Timaeus or the Laws, for example, it's, it's, an, it's an, just an enormous speech. And every 10 or 15 pages, somebody says, you don't say. And then the person goes back into their speech. So it's dialogue and form. And one thing that we want to ask ourselves is, why stay in dialogue form if it seems like it's just one long speech? What is it about the... And so this question about dialogue is extremely important and really pertinent. What does it mean to have a dialogue if I, if I talk for, like I am now, for an, an hour and nobody really gets a word in edgewise? Is that a dialogue? It, there are quotes around the speech, so it's not Plato. So you have to ask ourselves, maybe it's about attribution or responsibility or various and sundry other things. Um, but I want to go back to, and I want to get this in before, before we, I move on, is I want to talk about what the, um, what, we, what he means by what I mean by stages and what I mean by the way to learn, the way to discuss, the way to use dialogues as instructional tools. Albinus says, um, this is the ideal student, which I think is a very interesting um, thing to discuss. Someone well born by, by nature, who is at the right age to philosophize, who proceeds so toward reason for the sake of practicing excellence according to his motivation, who was previously taught by instruction in the mathematical sciences, this goes back to your point, according to his disposition, and who has been released from political entanglements. Such a man will begin with the Alcibiades for the sake of reversing his previous course and turning toward and recognizing what he ought to care about. So that's why we start with the Alcibiades which is the very first work that he says we're supposed to begin with. What's interesting is that most of us don't read the Alcibiades because we don't know if it's actually Plato's. Al um, Albinus thought it was. 
So the case of reversing your previous course and turning toward and recognizing what he ought to care about. So let's go back to what Claudia was getting at. If we have where she was going, if we have a dialogue where I prove that someone doesn't know what he or she thinks they know, he or she knows, then what I'm doing for myself, perhaps by reading that, is clearing away my own bad habits, my own uh, mistaken ideas, reversing my previous course and turning toward and recognizing what I ought to care about. So the idea is, in and this is the next this is the next step. Since he is a moral exemplar, to see it, since that this idea of seeing what the philosopher is is a moral example what the philosopher studies and by what sort of hypothesis his instruction is carried forward, it's necessary to delve into the Phaedo next in order. That's the next um, work that we're all supposed to read. For Plato says in this dialogue what the philosopher is, what he studies, and upon the hypothesis of his immortality, of his soul's immortality, he goes into his count of the soul. After this, it would be necessary to read The Republic, because Plato describes all the types of education starting at the earliest age by which someone would arrive at the possession of virtue. In addition, since it is also necessary to have knowledge of divine matters, this is where we end, so that someone has acquired virtue, is able to become assimilated to them, and them are the gods. We will delve into the Timaeus. So the idea is, the Albinus, Albinus believes that we start with Alcibiades I, or the Alcibiades, because it concerns knowledge of self, the knowledge of the self is the first requisite for someone who wants to be a philosopher, right? So in one of his contemporaries says, philosophy is a striving for wisdom, the freeing and turning around of the soul from the body when we turn towards the intelligible and what truly is. So I'm tempted to say, or we're tempted to say in middle Platonism, in this early, early common era Platonism, you turn toward and turn in at the same time. Um, then you read the Phaedo because the Phaedo teaches you the nature of the philosophic life. What is it to uh, have a love of the truth or of the process of, 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 of approaching the truth? Um, and, it, and he takes for, the, for his premise the immortality of the soul. Why is that? The philosopher who turns away from the body and focuses on the soul in the Phaedo happily anticipates death as a separation of the soul from the body and anticipates the afterlife of the soul. So the idea is, and this is a quote, other people are likely not to be aware that those who pursue philosophy well study nothing but dying and being dead. And what's important about that is in the Phaedo is that he says, but we can't do it ourselves. We can't... Um, take our own lives because we didn't create ourselves, we don't own ourselves. You might imagine that all of these ideas line up for the Christians absolutely perfectly, right? The, the, the inability, because you are not an author of yourself, of taking your own life, but the idea of anticipating the afterlife of the soul, the separation of the soul of the body, you can imagine that, this, that these, are just, these can just be taken verbatim from Plato and move right into Christian literature. The Republic sketches the um, complete educational theory, which you're probably emulating when you're reading the dialogues, and the Timaeus, since it takes us whole, uh, uh, it takes us through a whole range of things, actually, both natural and divine. But it leads us to what he says is a clear view of divinity. Um, so I just wanted to talk for a second about the ideal. Now that's the student who is under all circumstances the perfect the, the perfect candidate for these dialogues. What I like about Albinus, and this is what we'll talk about maybe the next time, is he has a second ordering of the dialogues. And I would contend that it's a dialogue, and it, what he does is he doesn't talk about dialogues by name. He talks about the type of dialogue that you're supposed to read. And I'll make sure that um, Claudia gets this list so that you can you can follow along. But the dialogues that this the second order he he gives is an expanded list of types of dialogues that we're supposed to read. For example, a cathartic dialogue where you cleanse the soul of its mistaken ideas 
and he actually uses the verb for catharsis. And of course, as many as you know, many of you know, catharsis wasn't first invented by Aristotle talking about tragedy, right? He talks about tragedy as a cathartic enterprise. I, I would contend for the audience, but maybe for the actors as well. But it's originally, 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 a term, a horticultural term. Um, the, some of the first references we have to it is a horticultural term. When your garden is overgrown and you cut back your garden, you trim, you trim your garden, you organize your garden, right? Then it moves into medical terminology. When you lance and cleanse a boil, right? When you clean out that kind of infection, it's physical. And then we have it in Aristotle where it's... Um, it's of the soul. It's a. It's an infection of the soul that you that you that you cl purge and you purge and clean. And what the Middle Platonists do is they they take that right out of Aristotle and they apply it to the Platonic dialogues. And they say the first thing you have to do is you have to you have to cleanse yourself. You have to cleanse your your problematic ideas, um, so that you build on concrete rather than sand. Right. Um, the first thing you must do, he says, is I actually I love this whole quote. There's too much. I'm sorry. If one could discern the appropriate order order of the dialogues for the instruction of Plato, I mean for the person choosing for himself the teachings of Plato, since one must become, and that's why I think he's he's talking about someone who doesn't have a teacher who has looking at the 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 best. Um, order of the type of dialogue that dialogues that we're going to need in order to learn where we need to get to. Since one must become a spectator of one's soul, of divine things, and even the gods themselves, to grasp the most beautiful mind, that is the mind of the creator of the cosmos, the Demiurge, it is necessary first to cleanse the false beliefs of his assumptions. For doctors acknowledge, and this is a direct quote from Plato, for doctors acknowledge that the body is not able to enjoy the food offered to it unless one could cast out the things that are acting as obstacles in it. So when you're when food is stuck, you can't enjoy the food that you offer your body. This is the same for your soul. You can't enjoy the nutrients of your soul if you've got obstacles standing in the way. So we go back to this medical idea, right? And that's from Plato's Sophist 230. Um, you have to remove the obstacles before you can enjoy um, what's going on. And after cleansing, and again, this is he uses the word ekathare, the verb for catharsis, and it's intensified with that prefix ek. After cleansing, he must awaken and call forth natural concepts, the things that you have inside of you that you already know to be the case. These are this is a Stoic idea. It's important. You know. These natural concepts, we call them physikai enoi, is the, is the Greek. You have them inside of you. You need to bring them out. And you have to clean those as well. Then you exhibit them as principles, as archai, as we go back to mathematics. You exhibit them as principles, irrefutable starting points, right? So then, um, since, the, since you've prepared your soul, it's necessary to introduce doctrines appropriate to it. And these doctrines relate to physics, theology, ethics, and politics. These are the, some of the first uses of the, of the Greek word for theology in the second century. Um, then, in order that the doctrines may remain in the soul, so they don't fly away, unable to escape, it's necessary to bind them with what he calls causal reasoning. And this is logismos. Logismos is amazing. Logismos is the sort of noun of the, lo of the logos that you learn in, in Greg Nagy's classes. Logismos is the method. In, in Middle Platonism, it's not a science. It's not a subject you study. You don't study logic. Logic is a thing you use in order to study other things properly. So with causal reasoning, logismos, so that someone may securely take hold of the desired aim, and this is where I want to end. I know we have four minutes, but um, <clears throat> we, where, we want, where we want the desired aim to be is 
these types of dialogues that we read make reference to the assimilation um, to God. And here he uses the singular. Um, because um, this is the true purpose of Middle Platonism. Vision of the gods and assimilation to the gods. Assimilation being like the gods, and this is a highly contested and probably the most hackneyed phrase in all of Christian and Christian era non-Christian literature is what um, homoiotenai teoi, homoiosis teoi means. What does it mean to be assimilated to the gods? And I have an, I have a, an interest in this because in order to become the philosopher king in this early in this early period, Marcus Aurelius, Constantine, you have to have a vision of the gods and then you can apply that to politics. I want to know, I'm interested in knowing how the vision of the gods applies, how that, what's the movement, what's the action there in which one applies the vision of the gods to tr real politics on the ground in order to become a philosopher king. And the last thing he talks about, and I think this is true for all of us, um, the reason you need to talk about refutative types, um, refutation types of dialogues and probative types of dialogues is that we must, it, we must learn how one must listen to the sophists and how and in what way to address those who make bad arguments. It's important, it's important, right? Because it's not just that we're learning the thing, these things for ourselves. Every, the, the philosopher king, all of the philosophers, reluctantly must go out in the world. They must spread what they learn. They must try to help. This is what Socrates did. He was Athens' gadfly. He tried to help them correct themselves, their own ideas, their own information. And as he knows in, the, in Plato's Apology, that's why he killed, they killed him. Because... Because that's because that's upsetting. There's nothing more upsetting than being confronted with your own your own mistakes, your own ignorance, right? Right. It's dazzling, right? And in moving the the kind of ideas that you're setting out and the influence that they had over such a broad range of time, um, both for you know societies and cultures and for individuals within them. So, uh, you know, I know it's 11:59. I'm wondering now, is there any chance you could say a little bit later to take a few questions from the Q and A? Oh, absolutely. Or, okay. Yeah. So if anyone needs to leave, I understand, you know, our yeah. original time was 12, so please do not feel bad if you need to head out. Uh, but if you can stay, that's great. So can we turn first to the Q&A feature? Yeah, okay. Thank uh -huh. you so much. Yeah, while, I'm, I'm, while I'm going over, the stylistics point by Jack is absolutely how they've done it. Great. I was just um, going to point to Jack next, actually, so yeah, great. Yeah, the, the stylistics, that's absolutely how they've done it. And and now there's there are very there are very highly technical computer programs that show how the development of stylistics. And that's helped tremendously to, to look at the, the chronology of the dialogues. Then there are moments in which um, there are there are intricacies and minutia that don't allow one to do it exactly because for example I mean one of the one of the things and this is a word you all familiar with in, in from Greg Nagy's class mimesis um, Plato was a was a genius at imitation um, the there's a there in his um, in uh, in one of the dialogues he has a speech of, of Lysias and um, and according to stylistics, it could be, it could very well be a, a, a speech of Lysias. It's probably not, but he was able to imitate Lysias flawlessly. Er, and Aristophanes, he imitated Aristophanes in the Symposium almost perfectly. So, so it's it's tricky because he's he's probably smarter than all of our computers huh. to be to be, and he's able. He would, I think, he could he could confound them pretty easily. But there is a lot that can be done with style with stylometrics. Um, absolutely, and I know I'm not the one. I'm not the one to to talk about this. Um, okay, so let's. Okay, so let's. Do we go down to the bottom first? Players' uh, development, individual. Sure. If if we can, uh, let's see how much we can cover here. You know. Yeah. Great. So uh, Plato's development as an individual and also as a philosopher, you would think, would unfold in a chronological order marked by catalyt uh, catalytic events. Death of Socrates being one of them. Absolutely, he didn't start writing until after Socrates was was killed, right? So Plato started his dialogues after 399. 
Um, one thing, the only thing I, I, know, I have any idea that I, I, about Plato that I could think I could say is that he loved Socrates. I think that's one thing that we can say about Plato. He loved him. And that was a, that was a, a damaging moment. And to his own ideas of democracy, I think. I mean, this is a person, Plato is a person who is criticizing democracy while democracy is really um, um, gelling and concretizing. In, in some ways. I mean, that's extraordinary. The Republic is, is really harsh um, on, 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 on democracy. Um, there are ideas, so there's, if you, you know, it's always false to put people in two camps. Um, but one, one way that people go into different camps of, 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 of the understanding of Plato's dialogues is first, there was no development. He knew what he was, he knew what he was doing from the very beginning. There is a reference to the there's a, a reference to the forms in the Euthyphro, which is maybe one of the very first dialogues, and that's that holds all the way to the laws, which was maybe one of the last. Um, the other is that is that, and he and he just wrote them the way he wanted to write them. But he always had this. There was no development of Plato. He just he just knew what he knew, or had the philosophy that he had, as it were. The other is that he. Um, he did develop as as that first um, Socrates' way was not getting him anywhere. Ending in aporia, ending in no way out, not having any principles established at that point doesn't really get you very far except to keep breaking down, to constantly be using philosophy perhaps as a kind of weapon and it doesn't get you any 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 doesn't get you further in understanding what justice is or courage is or anything else and that his ideas of the forms came out of socrates idea that if we could just define perfectly what an abstract notion is an ethical abstract notion is um, so that it, that definition would hold under all contexts and circumstances for every human being if we could just do that then we would know what courage is what justice is socrates never According to this, this idea about the Socratic dialogues, Socrates never got that far. So Plato established or believed in the forms. And the form of justice is, so all things that we call just participate in this form of justice in some way. And participate is a really abstract, difficult term. He uses the Greek as different in a couple of ways. We're not really sure what that means. But there's a reason why we call all just things just. They all participate in this idea, even if we can't necessarily define it in concrete terms. And that's what philosophy is. Philosophy is the attempt to, to define what justice is, to contemplate the form of justice until we get it. And that's maybe what ta tea is. Maybe that's what the divine thing or things are that Plato's talking about. Um, and, then, and then in the later dialogues, he knows what's going on. He's got the Timaeus, he's got the laws, and he just sort of lays it all out, right? Um, so it's so 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 yes that you but you have to decide that for yourself <laughs> which way which camp you're going to fall into and I'm not going to talk about what I think okay can we I don't want to influence that but yes can we um, go to the next question so this yes. is by Colin um, so he's saying you mentioned the impact of Plato on Christianity what is your thoughts on pseudo Dionysius yeah yeah this is a really really interesting text. Um, the Areopagite, right? Is this the this is the text we're looking at, and um, it's um, well, I mean this 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 is a this is a um, a, a text and a and a and a, and a that it would take a whole common session unto itself. Okay. Okay. Um, but but I, but I can say I can try to say a couple of things. Um. um I, I think um, well okay the <clears throat> the general out the outlook of um, so one of the major influences that Plato had on early Christianity Methodius of Olympus is an example of this is the idea of ideal the ideal city and the city we have here. 
of everything in the in heaven, as it were, being perfect. So the form of and this com, comes from the idea of the form of justice is the perfect culmination or notion or definition of justice. And what we have down here are slightly inferior human material examples of justice. And in Methodius of Olympus and in a lot of these situations, there's this sort of angelic hierarchy um, that comes out in, in Johann Eck in, the, in, the, in Martin Luther as um, the, perfect, the perfect city in, and the, the perfect church, the, the, Christian church, the perfect Christian church in heaven and, the one, and what is what, that we have um, down here. Um, so the the identity of Dionysus is still completely um, disputed. Um, um, he is probably a pupil of of, of Proclus, um, who fused. Um, he, this is Dionysus, um, who knew enough um, Platonism and Christian Christianity to, um, and Proclus did this as well in in, in a lot of ways to fuse the two traditions. Um, and um, so, again, this is, this is much, much bigger, but he, sure, he's sure. In a, that, that text is an example of, I think, a, of, of a, one of the most remarkable or, or, um, e examples of, of fusing um, Platonism and, and Christianity, Christian tradition, as it has established and been influenced by Plato that I know of. Um, but it's, I'm not an expert on it by any means, but it's, it's, you're on the right track if you read that text in a, in a Platonist and Christian um, as a Platonist and Christian fusion. Beautiful. Uh, yeah. You know, can we turn back to our, our, our dialogue partners here sort of in the room? Uh, and I know for some we've been taking questions from our chat bar, but I'd like to welcome people to ask a question, um, you yeah. know, just outright if they, if they have one. So does anyone in the room have a question or a comment so far on what we've been discussing? Bill, yeah. So I noticed over on the uh, questions and answers that uh, Kimmy was talking about the mystic religions back in the era, in, during yes. that era. Uh, yes. I know from a little bit of studying on the Kabbalah I did that uh, there seems to be a connection between Plato and Kabbalah. You got any insights on that kind of stuff? Um, uh, <clears throat> no, I don't, to be perfectly honest with you. There's, there's an interesting, there's a really interesting, his, um, there are a lot of really fascinating um, parallels um, that can be made with with parallel. I, with I know I know that there are people who have done a lot of work on that, and I haven't. But there's the perfect year in the in the Republic, um, which I don't remember the exact number right now. Um, is is a number that's found in um, a Vedic um, a Vedic work that, and it can't be a coincidence. I mean, I'll, I can look up the the perfect year in Plato. It's it's really. Um, um, I have a note on it here. Um, the great year, yeah. Um, it is. Um, it's the it's the amount of time that one that a soul needs to um, to circle the equinoxes until it's able to come back into the um, soul soup and be reborn again. It has to do with. Um, um, it's twenty five thousand eight hundred years. Is known as the Platonic year, and I have found it in a in a Vedic um, um, text as well. So there are a lot of really interesting par parallels. Um, there's a, and this and a lot of these parallels, I think, um, ha have to do with the the hagiography of Plato that he visited India, um, which a lot of people want to say that he visited Egypt, that he. Um, that he influenced and had a lot to do with um, a lot of other traditions and um, and peoples because his ideas are found in other places and whether or not that's because they're archetypical in some ways or if it's a but it, there's a there is a lot of work out there if you put Plato and Kabbalah into uh, not a lot there's some work that I've seen but I, I don't I don't really know very much about that the I I, I do think that. The old tradition, the old concept of um, this is Harnack in some ways Christianity that that a that a mono that a monotheistic Christianity swooped in and replaced a polytheistic um, paganism is is 
in the first century, in the first few centuries of the common era, is has been now been complicated. Everything that I've read about religion in the in the in the third, second, and first centuries in BC, everything is moving toward a monotheism. Cult traditions, um, cult figures are becoming more and more important. Um, um, everything is moving. It's not that they, you don't, there's not a belief in other gods, but everything's moving toward. Uh, cities are looking at cult, at, at particular cult uh, um, um, practices and that sort of thing. And of course, of course, but um, the Trinity, the the idea of the Trinity doesn't come out until the second or third or even last part of the second century, and isn't firmly defined and really understood until the fourth century, in 371, 372, and Basil of Caesarea is one of the ones who, in a letter, it's an extraordinary letter, um, really gives us the idea of Trinity that we have now. Um, but it's the osea of the Trinity, the sharing of the Trinity, the differences of personage and uh, in essence is highly contested and not at all established. And so their um, um, Christians are accused of being Trinitarians and polytheistic by other um, sects of, of Christianity for centuries. Um, if I can just say, I just want to say the image that he comes up with and to explain the Trinity really quickly, because it's, I think it's one of the most beautiful images um, I know of. Um, so, the, so you're talking about Basil now, right? This is Basil of Caesarea, and he does it through Aristotle and Plato. He does it through his understanding of um, ancient philosophy. He says, okay, so the thing about Christianity um, in the fourth century is you have to determine how much of God is um, immutable, and not of 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 sorry of um, um, unsayable, unspeakable. So everyone has a different line that they won't cross. So for some of them, um, you can't say anything about God, even almost that you can't say anything about God. <laughs> For others, you can explain God in, in, very, um, in very important ways. A transcendent God, an imminent God, a God that keeps life together, a creator God. And um, Basil and, of Caesarea and the Cappadocians have cut the line right at the Trinity. And this is an extraordinary image that I think he comes up with. He says, well, there's this thing. So don't worry about the usia. Don't worry about the essence of God because that's beyond us. But to understand how the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit are are one, um, some of you are, under, are, are, are are familiar with the rainbow. And the rainbow, um, I know when green, what part of the rainbow is green, and I know what part of the rainbow is yellow. I don't know when the green turns into yellow and when the yellow turns into green, but it happens. But I don't need to know that because I know where the green is and I know where the yellow is. And all of it is of the same substance. The entire rainbow is of this, whatever it is. It's all the same stuff. But I can tell you when one becomes the other and the other, I, I can tell you that one is distinguished from the other, but I can't necessarily tell you exactly the moment when the yellow turns into green and the green turns into yellow. And that was it. That was it. From then on, people used that kind of idea of the Trinity, um, the Cappadocians, um, a particular Basil Caesarea. And um, I mean, there were other contentions. There are going to be other battles that happened, but that is by and large the image that we come out with in the fourth century. So my point is only this. I think I, we, we want to complicate the idea that religion wasn't turning toward a monotheism, a kind of particular figure, Godhead, and that Christianity was this absolutely established monotheistic religion that swooped in and replaced it. That's totally off topic. I, this is something I wanted to talk about. No, that's beautiful. And in fact, you know, it, it could be really interesting. So for people in our project who have, let's say, read a lot of Homer and read some Plato, I mean, the Cappadocian Fathers are really interesting for many, many, many reasons. But for instance, Gregory of Nazianzus is, is very interested 
in the diction of Homer, right? I mean, this is a really, really interesting writer. Completely, and completely. He and knows it inside and out. I mean, if, he, if you, he, it's fascinating. So it's someday he, maybe we could talk about that. That's um, absolutely it. There are certain words that only appear, the last time they appear is really in Homer, and it's, in, and it's what, 12 centuries between them. And uh, Gregory of Nyssa was called a Platonist, uh, in, a Christian Platonist um, in antiquity as well. Gregory of Nazianzus also highly influenced by Plato, and Basil, I, I would contend, is is it, un, he was he was in Athens learning about Plato with Julian, the emperor Julian, and Julian certainly knew that his Plato as well. His whole many of his works, he was trying to figure out what the philosopher king would would look like, whether political or purely theoretical. So these are all, these are, the 4th century is a, is a really important um, time for Homer and Plato, another resurgence of Plato and Homer besides the first couple of centuries of the, the common era. Yeah. Okay, so now we're really over here. I always think we might end at 1215. Uh, so again, if you need to go, exactly, so Jack, I, I'm actually going to take your question. So maybe yeah. we could just say, um, maybe we could aim for 1225. Can we, can we do this in in that time period? Is that okay? I got it. No, please. You're sure? You're so generous I'm, with your time. I'm, I'm just thinking that, you know, that our, our understanding of the history of uh, ideas, religion, and philosophy is, of course, limited by the fact, all the filters through which we we receive the thinking of the, of the, the oldest thinkers we have some kind of access to but but they themselves were were um, um, preceded by um, a lot of prehistoric uh, a lot of prehistory of ideas and prehistory of religion and prehistory of philosophy um, so so we you know it's like uh, here we get these first uh, writings of philosophy um, and and that's actually at the uh, uh, the end of a long uh, uh, yeah. period of uh, of thinking and and sharing and absolutely and, uh, and 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 so then these things come apart and then they come back together absolutely and, and it's uh, it seems as though they uh, it there's an Unlimited number of uh, combinations, yeah. Uh, and and, and the, the, we in the writings, it seems to me that uh, so much of uh, the differences are emphasized, and uh, what they have um, in common about the spirit uh, is uh, is so much a larger thing. Apart yes. I, it's it's you're absolutely right. I mean everything you've said. So one of the one of the other things that one should 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 read in order to get a certain aspect of Plato are the Pre-Socratics, are those who came before, are, are these early thinkers? Because because you can pull very. I mean Plato himself argues within his own dialogues about various things that were held to be true by the these by these very early. Um, uh, um, philosophers, these early thinkers, um, specifically about the forms and truth and what is, what is as opposed to what is becoming. Right? We're all becoming, but we we're not static. Only truth, only truth for Plato is absolute and unchanging. But I start out my um, history of, of philosophy classes with Homer, um, because because there are plenty of ideas, plenty of ideas of what's right and what's wrong. And and that's as you say that's the end of a of a tradition before that right and Plato is is steeped in all the stuff before him so there's a there's a writer um, Philo Judaeus who is uh, in the in the first century BCE who I think is one of the most extraordinary um, events his life of in in antiquity he's a he's a he's a whirlwind he's he never knew Christianity. Um, um, but we read him, and my students say, there's no way, there's absolutely no way that Plato didn't read Philo of Judaeus, 
<laughs> right? <laughs> right? There's no way. In addition, there's no way that um, that 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 Father Judeish didn't read the New Testament. So, so somebody mentioned something about Panhellenic. I mean, there are these ideas about truth and, as you as you say, spirit and soul and and um, right and wrong that are that are floating in the in the aether. They just they and and some of these people are grabbing them and pulling them down and putting them to words. And some of them are not, right? I mean, Socrates didn't write anything. Jesus of Nazareth did not write anything. There have some very interesting parallels. We only know things that their followers wrote about them, right? And so um, there are, there are. I mean, Cicero is the one who said um, Socrates grabbed philosophy from the from the sky and brought it to earth, right? So, um, which is which is an amazing. Um, and he's probably he's probably uh, repeating somebody else, you know. So I think that this all is just all of this stuff is one giant conversation that's been going on for millennia, and where we have different aspects of it, different emphases coming forward at different times. But I think that shouldn't prevent us from pulling all these people together, and and imagining them having one giant conversation. That's really what's going on here. It's what we're doing here. And it's what they're doing, right? They're all we're acting and reacting against one another, and sometimes people we don't even have. We only have, what, 32, 37 percent of all ancient writing, depending on where you have a, a, a cutoff. So who knows what, who's responding to what, but absolutely the, all of this stuff is part of one enormous, and, and people for that matter, I mean, a lot of my students will think, well, uh, you know, the Fido talking about the, these ideas about the soul. Well, this had to have been written after the Bible after New Testament, right? So it, it's so chronology can sometimes just be can sometimes just get in the way. It's also very interesting, right? It's really important to imagine about influences and look at links and the way people um, but as I mentioned before, and this is where we sort of started in the second sophistic, didn't really matter. Homer and Plato need to be they need to be put to, uh, side by side. Because they talked about the same things. They talked about right and wrong, and good and bad, and courage, and justice, and generosity, and all of you know. For all of the, for the second sophistics, Homer had thought about every human emotion. Could it how somehow have imagined right? And and whether or not that's right, somebody thought it. And we need to go back and try to figure out. What that what that means to say something like that? Right. And the Trinity could be the one, and the Ahoris dos duas. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's, yeah. That's, it. That's <laughs> it. That's it. That's it. So this conversation continues. The logos yeah. continues, right? Because it's just it's just still going. And I and I think and um, the Platonic, Professor Naj is pointing about that. Platonic dialogues, you know, methodically, you know, they they are they're going to be the most challenging. Way to there it is to get you uh, to to think about the, the whole the to, to pond, to, to pond, to pond. That is exactly it. And if and if that's what was Plato was doing in his in his academy, which was just reading the dialogues and talking, we then we just have to go. We have to go read the dialogues and come back and talk again. That's exactly it. All right, Ryan. So you have been the most generous and uh, thoughtful. And knowledgeable guide to us uh, as we are really starting to reembark on our study of Plato and on yeah. philosophy. Um, yeah. So, you know, I really, really, really appreciate your time. I have to say, this has been really inspirational. You make me want to clear my schedule and go read. Um, That's it. That's it. Yeah. It's all. It's as Albinus knows. It's a lot of it's about leisure, right? How much time <laughs> do you have to to commit? Lock yourself in a room and read all of Plato, and come back out, and we'll have a conversation. That's yeah. Well, Right. Well, you've done so much for us, so uh, we'll be in contact, um, and uh, I don't know, great. Brian, we're just so delighted to talk with you. I hope everyone oh, uh, will look up your book. Can you tell us the name of your book? The Imperial Plato. Woohoo! Okay, and uh, the link for that is available on the Hour 25 website, and so uh, more soon. Thank you, everyone, for your time today. Looking forward to further dialogues. Bye-bye. Bye, everybody. Yeah, thanks. Thank you so much. Thank you, sir.